like to welcome you to uh, this, the third event of the year, the George Washington Forum. The Washington Forum is a citizen initiative founded on the idea that students facing an increasingly globalized world need to understand what particularly characterizes and distinguishes the nation in which they live and the civilization from which it emerged. Directly allied with the, uh, the, the forum's mission is to enhance civic education here at, uh, at Ohio University and provide a little more uh, intellectual diversity. At Washington Forum events, you'll hear voices not always heard at this university, and you'll have a chance to debate them directly and civilly. Tonight's lecture is made possible primarily by a grant from the Charles G. Koch Charitable Foundation, a foundation whose own mission is to foster wide-ranging, open, and public discussions about free societies and liberty. In the first Koch lecture this year, Harold James discussed the ways in which free societies should relate to one another economically and the ways they should order their economies at home especially in times of financial crisis. Shortly after that, John Yu came to talk about how best to protect this particular free society from foreign and domestic threats. Tonight's speaker, Brad Gregory, comes at the problem from a slightly different direction as he investigates what were the origins of modern Western free societies. Gregory comes to us from the University of Notre Dame where he's the Dorothy G. Griffin Associate Professor of Early Modern European History. He did an undergraduate degree in history at Utah State University, to advanced degrees in philosophy at the Catholic University of Louvain, an MA at Arizona, and finally a PhD in history at Princeton University. Before taking up his position as a uh, at Notre Dame, he was a junior fellow in the Harvard Society of Fellows and a faculty member at Stanford University. He received early tenure and won that university's highest teaching award. His first book, Salvation at Stake, Christian Martyrdom in Early Modern Europe, received six book awards. And in the fall, Harvard University Press will publish his second book, A Major Study of the Reformation Era and the Making of Modernity, whose title he does not even know now. After John Yu's visit here last year, some people said to me, well, I bet you're glad um, that nobody this controversial is gonna be here again this year. And I thought to myself, if you thought that was controversial, you ain't seen nothing yet. And I thought that because I knew Professor Gregory would be here tonight. In his forthcoming book, he traces the origins of our current situation back to the late Middle Ages. And his conclusions are bracing. For he concludes that the Western experiments in liberty, be they Rousseauian or Madisonian or Marxist or Hayekian, or all of them, properly understood, experiments in arbitrariness. There are, in the modern West, he argues, no real governors on our engine, either individually or collectively. The logic of our condition is a kind of self-chosen anarchy, and the origins of that anarchy are to be found in the religious reformations of the 16th century. To explain why that's the case, I'll leave to Professor Gregory, but I hope you'll join with me tonight and welcome you here to Ohio University. Thanks very much, uh, Robert, for that, that introduction. And now everybody's going to be sitting on the edge of their seats, I know, wondering what, what on earth I'm going to say that will uh, actually match that, uh, that introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've had a wonderful day um, meeting with some of you. Uh, giving a lecture to some of you earlier uh, this, this uh, midday, and uh, I've really enjoyed the hospitality thus far. So I will uh, speak for probably a little bit less than an hour. I will hope to hold your interest for that time, and then afterward, um, anyone who wants to have at it certainly may. This paper is as much about the present as it is about the distant past of early modern Europe. It addresses 16th century historical realities and how they gave rise to and continue massively to influence our situation in the United States today. I will call this situation the postmodern condition. By this term, I mean nothing esoteric, rather simply a cluster of realities intended as an uncontroversial description of human life both inside and outside the academy in the Western world of the early 21st century. So before talking about the past, I will say something about the present. I'll begin with academic life before moving on to the real world. As I'm using the term, the postmodern condition includes, first, 
the proliferation of research data in the humanities and social sciences on a completely overwhelming scale. To read and master all the scholarship in, say, cognitive psychology or modern French history, let alone psychology or history in general, is impossible. To say nothing of integrating all the research findings of multiple academic disciplines. Besides this overwhelming mass of data, all of the humanities and social sciences, with the possible exception of economics, at least for the time being, are marked by methods and theories that presuppose incompatible assumptions and contrary truth claims. These methods, approaches, theories, and assumptions reflect in turn different ideas about what the important problems and questions are within different fields and respective dif disciplines, as well as divergent notions about how disagreements concerning theory and the prioritization of research questions might be resolved. For example, in my own discipline, post-structuralist cultural historians, quantitative economic historians, traditional political historians, and deeply archival social historians do such different things based on such different approaches derived from such discrepant convictions about what matters in the human past that they can scarcely talk to one another if they even want to. The same is true of, say, continental philosophers and analytical philosophers of language, or of cultural and physical anthropologists. Indeed, the same applies mutatis mutandis to every discipline in the social sciences and the humanities, again, with the possible exception of economics, where the neoclassical paradigm and rational choice theory are virtually hegemonic, hegemonic at the moment. The result of this tidal wave of data across the disciplines based on discrepant theories and methods and characterized by intellectual and moral disagreements about what matters is an overwhelming pluralism, a hyperpluralism, we might say. Given the enormous range of different human views expressed, beliefs held, practices enacted, politics pursued, and values asserted across all cultures and periods, combined with the different scholarly theories, methods, approaches, and disputes about resolving contradictions in the study of the data, this hyperpluralism seems to lead ineluctably to some form of relativism, to some version of the claim that everything is constructed. From the plethora of moral norms, social values, religious beliefs, political views, truth claims, and so forth, it is inferred that all such human phenomena can only be culturally and historically relative and contingent. So the only truth, always put within quotation marks, is that there is no objective truth. The only answer to questions about meaning, purpose, value, and so forth is that there are no universal answers. What seems to make the postmodern condition inescapable is that any intervention that attempts to transcend it, a new finding, theory, or idea, ends up simply augmenting the hyperpluralism. Ironically, this also applies to the claim that everything is constructed, which, if we're consistent, turns out to be merely one more competing construction among others, and which in its current forms arose for intelligible reasons in the late 20th century. Literary scholars' assertions in recent decades about the fiction or fragmentation, the dissolution or disappearance of the self, for example, have not superseded the ideas that they criticize. They only comprise additional truth claims about the self alongside the rival views which they reject, but which also persist. In this sense, the humanities and the social sciences contrast starkly with the natural sciences and mathematics. In whatever field of the social sciences and humanities, new theories and approaches almost never establish a persuasive consensus, but rather only add to the sum total of possibilities for analyzing texts, explaining change over time, or interpreting human behavior. As a result, with respect to questions about human life, concerning morality, meaning, purpose, or values, the humanities and social sciences exhibit an ever-expanding articulation of divergent truth claims as part of a completely unmanageable quantity of data generated by discrepant research agendas and ideological commitments. Every attempt to escape from the postmodern condition only increases its characteristic hyperpluralism. What's more, besides no, because no theoretical position rests on self-evident consensual presuppositions, every starting point is vulnerable to criticism and subversion. So one's own theoretical and ideological commitments, whatever their content, are open to the same relativization as, a, as that applied to everyone else's. If everything is constructed, this applies no less to one's own views and commitments 
to, than to those one happens to criticize in one's scholarship. And if one's own views are constructed in this sense, then like every other view, they are ultimately arbitrary. Insofar as one cannot give compelling reasons why one ought to adopt certain views rather than others, they are a function of personal preference, to be sure, but not of defensible reasons that can transcend their merely preferred status. In practice, however, this self-admission of arbitrariness seems rare. Almost always, each of us continues to argue as if our respective views were correct and the presuppositions on which they rest justified, as if our views were privileged exceptions to the relativistic constructedness that supposedly characterizes all views, positions, and commitments. Hyperpluralism, in other words, does not collapse into a uniform, homogeneous relativism, which it should if the inference of relativism from pluralism were followed consistently. Instead, the postmodern condition in the academy remains marked by a vast range of competing assertions, rival claims, and divergent intellectual and moral commitments. The wider world in this respect resembles the academy with one key difference. The controlling metaphysical assumptions of secular universities exclude substantive religious views from consideration as possible sources of truth. In the wider world, by contrast, religious views are everywhere, and in great variety, although this is muted in Europe because of its atypical secularization. Nevertheless, in the Western world today, we find an overwhelming pluralism of different secular and religious views, moral positions and political commitments, familial arrangements, truth claims, and assertions about human beings and human values, all held together by mostly enforced laws and pervasive consumerism within a framework of liberal political institutions. Regardless of the country in which one lives in Europe or North America, therefore, one lives in this kingdom of whatever. As in the academy, very few people in the real world relativize their own truth claims and the behaviors related to them. So the postmodern condition in the kingdom of whatever is by no means restricted to the ivory tower. It is an obvious social, political, and cultural reality characteristic of late modern democratic capitalist societies, one heightened by the influx of peoples from non-Western countries and cultures. Its core is a hyperpluralism of conflicting truth claims and correlative human practices, every intervention in which increases the pluralism. It seems to engender relativism, even as nearly all of its participants retain the conviction that their respective views are correct. My forthcoming book from Harvard University Press is an attempt to understand the historical formation of this situation. Its working subtitle, and which might become its title if we can't agree on what the title should be, is The Reformation Era and the Makings of Modernity. The book's central argument is that we cannot grasp the nature of the Western world today without analyzing the complex, tangled, and unexpected combination of ideological and institutional historical realities that have led to it over the long term, longer than most historians think. Paradoxically, but precisely for this reason, the character of and the relationships among these historical realities tend to remain hidden from historians who ordinarily work within a given historical period, often further delimited by national focus and type of history. So we have Renaissance Italian political history or 19th century American legal history and many others. We can expand that indefinitely. Medievalists and early modernists rarely carry their analyses into the modern era, and modernists rarely investigate the pre-modern past. These subdivisions by period tend to reinforce the widespread, often subtle assumption that later historical periods leave earlier ones behind in sharply supersessionist ways. Peter Laslett's pre-modern world we have lost is assumed to have been left behind with the dramatic transformations wrought by the intellectual, political, and technological revolutions of modernity. Without question, the combination of capitalism and consumerism in the wake of the Industrial Revolution has hugely transformed the Western world, as did the Atlantic Revolutions and the Napoleonic Wars. But it does not follow that the pre-modern past is marginal to understanding the postmodern condition. I don't think we can understand where we are today without starting in the late Middle Ages. Because as I have sought to show in my book, the postmodern condition is the complex result of multiple departures from 
rejections of, retentions of, and transformations of Western Christianity, which provided life's institutional context and ideological content for nearly everyone in late medieval Europe, just as its central truth claims and related practices in Roman Catholicism continue to constitute part of our contemporary hyperpluralism. Common starting points for narratives of the modern Western world, the scientific revolution, the enlightenment, or the French revolution, begin too late and they presuppose too much to explain the character of our current situation. In order to shed more light, we need to proceed differently than the customary movement through chronological blocks in successive stages. And we need to begin before the 17th or 18th centuries. Methodologically, we need analytically to separate out and to follow in highly targeted ways from the late Middle Ages to the present, a number of influential strands across different domains of human life, which taken together in relationship to one another will enable us to account for the content and character of the postmodern condition. In large measure, the complexity of the entanglement of multiple consequential strands prevents both their origins in the deep past and their contemporary relevance from being seen. My book analyzes six such strands, three chiefly concerned with ideas and intellectual developments, and three that concentrate especially on institutional, economic, and political developments. The remainder of my lecture this evening is mostly a, a very compressed version of chapter two, one of the six chapters then, which concerns the bases of truth claims about questions pertaining to human purpose, morality, and meaning. I've also included a bit from chapter three, which analyzes the public exercise of power by states and their relationship to churches since the late Middle Ages. Let's leave the present and this opening discourse on method then and jump back five centuries. The first is the war. Our starting point is Western Christianity as embodied in the late medieval Latin church. The students who are in the lecture today, sorry, you're going to get a redux of some of the things that you already heard today. For better or worse, late medieval Christianity comprised an institutionalized worldview, a many-layered combination of beliefs, practices, and institutions built up over centuries. Deeply embedded in medieval social life, political relationships, and the wider culture, its ostensible principal purpose was the sanctification of the baptized through the practice of the Christian faith such that they might be saved eternally when judged by God after death. The central truth claim of medieval Christianity was that the same transcendent God of love who was radically distinct from the universe he had created ex nihilo had become incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth. The church was the continuing instrument for the achievement of God's plan of salvation for the human race after the ascension of Christ that followed his crucifixion and resurrection. Western Christianity on the eve of the Reformation exhibits two major paradoxes. First, it combined sharp limits on orthodoxy with a wide tolerance of diverse local beliefs and practices. Beyond a few basic expectations and implicit affirmation of the truth claims that they presupposed, variety and voluntarism marked religious life, from minimal participation in collective practices to the spiritual athleticism of individuals such as Henry Suzo or Catherine of Genoa. But crossing the wrong lines could quickly land one in serious trouble, as the Valdensians, Lollards, and Hussites knew firsthand. As a result, the church exhibited both an identifiable unity in doctrinal, liturgical, devotional, and institutional terms across Latin Christendom, from Iceland to Poland, from Scandinavia to Spain, and it exhibited a cornucopia of local religious customs voluntary devotional practices, specific ecclesiastical subgroups, particular jurisdictional privileges, divergent theological approaches, and syncretistic beliefs in a spectrum ranging from the impeccably orthodox to the edge of heresy. In this sense, the late medieval church was a large playground enclosed by forbidding fences, an enormous diversity held together in an overarching unity by a combination of custom, institutions, varying degrees of self-conscious dedication, and the threat of punishment. The second paradox of late medieval Christianity is its combination of long-standing, widely criticized shortcomings with unprecedented 
thriving lay devotion and dedication. Exactly what I was talking about in the lecture today. Notwithstanding some historians' claims about its purported spiritual decadence, the 15th century was arguably more devout than any preceding century in the history of Western Christianity. Never before had so many of the laity thrown themselves into their religious lives with such gusto, with so many devotions to Christ and the saints, confraternities, works of charity, practices of pious reading, and monetary contributions in support of the church. At the same time, criticisms of clerical corruption and greed, of lay superstition and ignorance, of manifest sinfulness by individuals in every station of life, were legion throughout the late Middle Ages. From the 14th century Avignonese papacy, through the decades of the Western Schism and into the 16th century, preachers such as Bernardino of Siena, reformers such as Jean Gerson, and churchmen such as Antonino of Florence, exhorted Christians to live as Christ and the church taught that they should live, imitating Christ and practicing the virtues. Such reforming efforts had an effect. New spiritual movements, such as the Devotio Moderna, enjoyed great success despite provoking suspicion. New confraternities, such as the Oratory of Divine Love, attracted members. The Observantine movement among the religious orders revitalized hundreds of male and female monasteries. And the sacred philology of the northern humanists sought through erudition and education to instruct and thus morally to renew Christians. But repeated calls for a systematic reform found no sustained response among popes and the papal curia, even when, under duress, Pope Julian II called the Fifth Lateran Council in 1512. The nepotistic, wealthy cardinals at the papal court and the aristocratic prince bishops of the Holy Roman Empire saw that any thoroughgoing, sustained reforms concerning simony, pluralism, and ecclesiastical revenues would undermine their wealth and privileges. The gulf between the church's prescriptions and the practices of its members, from clerical avarice in high places to lay superstition among the unlearned, ensured much space for constant calls to close the gap, from Catherine of Siena in the 1370s to Erasmus in the 15-teens. But the church's prescriptions, based on its truth claims, were a given. Apart from their rejection by members of small minority groups, such as the Bohemian Hussites, and the tiny number of English Lollards, and of course the small numbers of Jews and Iberian Muslims. The sometimes implicit doctrines that delimited orthodoxy were logically presupposed by practices such as the celebration of the liturgy, processions and pilgrimages, and prayers to saints, as well as by institutions such as the papacy, the sacerdotal priesthood, religious orders, and confraternities. The negotiated concordates that began in the 14 teens between late medieval rulers and popes altered neither the church's truth claims nor its assertions of right religious practice. Nor were its doctrines changed when some city councils in the Holy Roman Empire began wresting the jurisdictional control over many ecclesiastical affairs away from their respective bishops. For to reject the church's teachings was to reject its authority as the caretaker of God's saving truth the means of eternal salvation legitimated with biblical reference for more than a millennium to its establishment by Christ himself. This rejection is precisely what happened in the Reformation. According to all reformers who rejected its authority, the established Roman church was not the church established by Christ. So they spurned it and many truth claims of inherited Christianity. Their repudiation was not based primarily on the church's rampant abuses, the sinfulness of many of its members, or entrenched obstacles to reform. All of these things had been obvious to conscientious reformers for well over a century before the Reformation. No, the real point of the Reformation was that Roman Catholicism was a perverted form of Christianity even at its best, even if all of its members had been self-consciously following all of the Roman church's teachings, and enacting all of its permitted practices. Institutional abuses and immorality were seen as symptomatic signs of a flawed foundation, namely false and dangerous doctrines, that is, mistaken truth claims. Once the scales fell from long clouded eyes in the early Reformation, errors had to be rejected in light of God's truth. This meant comparing 
latter-day doctrines, practices, and institutions with the one genuine source for Christian faith and life, namely God's Word in Scripture, and cleaving to the latter. Martin Luther articulated the principle as early as July 1519 at the Leipzig Disputation. Quote, No faithful Christian can be forced beyond the sacred scripture, which is alone the divine law, unless new and approved revelation is added. Indeed, we are prohibited by divine law to believe unless it is supported by sacred scripture or palpably obvious revelation. The Roman Church had selfishly twisted or ignored the word of God to suit its own interests, from the bogus donation of Constantine to the revenue streams that poured into papal coffers from the sale of church offices. Their Lord commanded Christians to return to him in fidelity and holiness, in word and deed, guided by the Holy Spirit, beginning with God's own truth claims taught in the Bible, uncluttered by human traditions, pagan philosophies, and clerical manipulations back to the word of God, to the gospel, to the saving truth. There was just one problem. From the very beginning, those who rejected Rome disagreed about what God's word said, and so about what God's truth was. So they disagreed about what Christians were to believe and do. By March 1522, 1522 Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstadt disputed Luther's marginalization of the book of James, plus his views on the character of the Old Testament, Eucharistic practice, the oral confession of sins, and the permissibility of religious images. Luther and Melanchthon disagreed with Zwingli and the latter's reforming allies about the nature of Christ's presence in the Lord's Supper, a dispute that inspired scores of vitriolic pamphlets in less than four years and culminated in a dramatic face-to-face non-resolution at the Marburg Colloquy in 1529. This became the doctrinal, and therefore the ecclesial and social, headwaters of the distinction between Lutheran and Reformed Protestantism. Zwingli disagreed as well with his former colleagues, such as Balthazar Hubmeier and Conrad Grebel, over the biblical basis for infant baptism, with its dramatic ecclesiological implications for the nature of the Christian community, which led to the origins of Swiss Anabaptism by early 1525 a year before the Zurich City Council enacted capital legislation against the Anabaptists. By then, the German Peasants' War was raging, with leaders such as Thomas Munzer flatly rejecting Luther's sharp distinction between the gospel on the one hand and social, political, and economic concerns on the other. Yet other reformers, such as Hans Hergott and Michael Geismeyer, shared Munzer's appreciation for the gospel's socioeconomic implications but rejected his apocalyptic exhortations to violence, envisioning instead communitarian Christian societies predicated on a dismantling of feudal relations. Withdrawing from dreams of remaking society after the utter defeat of the common man in the Peasants' War, Anabaptists proved a highly contentious lot, disagreeing among themselves in a host of doctrinally and therefore socially divisive ways, beginning already in the late 1520s. I could go on and on, probably to some of you it seems like I already am in that paragraph, but okay. For analytical purposes, though, it would be superfluous. What I am saying is known to everyone with a textbook knowledge of the Reformation. And I am mentioning only a few major disagreements about the meaning, implications, and application of God's word from Central Europe in the 1520s. Expanding my point geographically and chronologically to encompass the entire Reformation era, up to the mid-17th century, only discloses many more disagreements and divisions, whether between so-called Philippists and Gnasia Lutherans in Germany in the decades after Luther's death in 1546, among Dutch Anabaptists beginning in the 1530s and continuing throughout the era, or between Reformed Protestants and Arminians in the Low Countries and England in the early 17th century. Christians who rejected the authority of the Roman Church and its truth claims notwithstanding certain alliances and reconciliations among some of the constituent groups from time to time, never exhibited anything remotely resembling agreement about their own alternative truth claims. What came to be called Protestantism, or if one prefers, non-Roman Western Christianity, was marked by disagreements about Christian truth even before Luther's formal condemnation in 1521. It exhibited more and more divergences throughout the Reformation era, 
and never came close to a common view concerning the meaning and implications of the Bible. Yet you might ask, Luther wrote in 1520, what then is this word, or in what manner is it to be used, since there are so many words of God? These were great questions. From the very outset of the Reformation, the shared commitment to sola scriptura led neither to clarity nor consensus. It immediately entailed an open-endedness of interpretation that proved doctrinally contentious, socially divisive, and sometimes politically subversive. Demands to conform to one among the rival interpretations could always be met, for example, with Acts 5.29, we must obey God rather than men. The Swiss Brethren used this passage to justify their rejection of oath-taking, much to Zwingli's consternation. Benoit Jacon of Geneva, however, quoted this verse in 1544 and cited the parable of the Good Samaritan to justify her view that having multiple sexual partners besides her husband was a legitimate expression of love for her brothers in Christ. The Genevan consistory was neither impressed nor amused. That was supposed to be funny. It's the only funny bit in the whole place. You guys are not the only audience not to laugh very much. Here is the surprising thing. In the insistence on scripture as the sole source for Christian faith and life, combined with the vast range of different ways in which the Bible was interpreted and applied, we have the fundamental ideological origin of the postmodern condition. For the sorts of disagreement about truth characteristic of the early Reformation have never gone away. They have only been transformed, modified, and expanded in terms of content even as efforts have been made to contain and manage their effects. And they have prompted in turn novel attempts to answer the sorts of questions that both the many varieties of Protestantism and Roman Catholicism provided and continue today to provide. Questions about truth, morality, values, human priorities and purpose, for example. One such type of alternative answer has been sought through modern philosophy, as I will discuss briefly in a few moments. Meanwhile, the proliferation of forms of non-Roman Christianity has proceeded apace down to the present. Through, for example, the democratization of Protestantism in the United States during the first half of the 19th century, masterfully studied by Nathan Hatch, and more broadly explored by historians such as George Marsden and Mark Knoll. Anyone who doubts Protestantism's persistence and proliferating pluralism need only open the yellow pages of an Athens phone book and look under churches after I finish my lecture this evening. One obstacle to seeing the relevance of the Reformation for the hyperpluralism of the postmodern condition has been the tendency of Reformation scholars not to devote much attention to the past after the late 17th century, and of early modernists not to venture really past 1789, the beginning of the French Revolution. Another has been the tendency of Reformation scholars analytically to separate the magisterial reformation, that is Lutheranism, Reformed Protestantism in the Church of England, from the radical reformation. Because radical Protestants rejected alliances between religious bodies and political authorities, they were not engaged in the ambitious demographic project to shape religious identities of entire populations, as were Catholics, Lutherans, or Reformed Protestants. Schwenkfelders shaped gender roles as little as the Swiss Brethren affected state building. Familists wielded no coercive power, and the Davidite influence on wider cultural trends was nil. Consequently, they and other radical Protestants have been left to specialists, while Reformation scholars focus on the important stuff, state and society, politics and power, culture and confessionalization. To be sure, all of these concerns are fundamental. We cannot understand the era and its consequences without understanding them. But therefore, to treat the Radical Reformation as little more than a curious sideshow is to miss its critical importance. Historically reintegrated with the Magisterial Reformation, it reveals how the Reformation as a whole provides a key to understanding the pre-modern roots of the postmodern condition via the full range of incompatible truth claims that a common commitment to sola scriptura produced. 
We should remember two things about anti-Roman reformers in the Reformation era. First, along with their Catholic counter-contemporaries, they understood that the principle of non-contradiction was required for the pursuit and assertion of truth in any domain of human life. So they knew that it was impossible for their respective contrary assertions all to be true in fact. Rival claims had to be mistaken if their own were true, a logical necessity that helps to explain the massive production of doctrinal controversy in literally tens of thousands of publications throughout the era, among Protestants, magisterial as well as radical, and between Protestants and Catholics. Second, anti-Roman reformers were not secular philologists, merely seeking accurate interpretations of ancient texts, but were rather Christians seeking eternal salvation in the present. They all thought that beyond scholarship, a correct understanding of the Bible, a genuine comprehension of God's word, depended on some sort of direct enlightenment by God. Expressions of this supplementary principle took different forms, whether it was an insistence on the work of the Holy Spirit in the heart of the believer, a distinction between the internal and the external word, or a contrast between God's living word and the mere letter of scripture. Simply reading the Bible, whether in translation or in the original languages, was not enough. If we are to receive and understand anything, Zwingli wrote, it must be given from above. Accordingly, the Reformation era is filled not only with professions about the foundational importance of scripture, coupled with discrepant views about what it meant, but also with claims about illumination by the Holy Spirit, God's action in the heart of a believer, William Tyndale's distinction between an historical faith and a feeling faith, and so forth. A distinction between those who were enlightened and those who were not, whatever the specific form, helped respective protagonists to explain why others stubbornly refused to see the truth. Whoever they were and whatever they claimed, they had not been taught authentically by God. The way out of darkness was to open oneself to the light, which suggested a means of overcoming the disagreements about God's teachings. But however satisfactory such criteria were in explaining to each interpreter how so many other biblical readers could be wrong, they proved utterly useless for resolving the doctrinal disagreements in which the respective parties were embroiled. As with the principle of sola scriptura itself, appeals to the Spirit's influence were voiced by those on all sides of every dispute. What am I to do, Erasmus asked already in 1524, when many persons allege different interpretations, each one of whom swears to have the Spirit? Indeed. This applies not only to minor, or to major figures rather, such as Luther, Zwingli, or Calvin, or to Anabaptist leaders such as Hans Hutt and Pilgrim Marpeck. It also pertains to those who embraced spiritualism in a more robust way, such as Caspar Schwenkfeld and Sebastian Franck in the early German Reformation, or English Quakers such as George Fox and James Naylor in the mid-17th century, with their emphasis on the inner light. On this issue, agreeing with Catholic controversialists, such spiritualists saw that Protestantism's very foundation had unintentionally created a jungle of incompatible truth claims among those who rejected the Roman Church. But spiritualists, for their part, mistakenly thought that they had found an escape from open-ended Protestant pluralism by downplaying the text of Scripture, relativizing the importance of doctrinal formulations altogether, minimizing external worship, and or insisting that Christianity was really all about spiritual and sometimes individualistic interiority. In fact, all such notions only added more rival truth claims and forms of Protestantism to the already existing pluralism, just like attempts to escape from the postmodern condition do today. Competing claims about the genuine understanding of scripture were compounded by competing claims about authentic inspiration by God. It was entirely unclear then, and remains so today, who among those claiming to have the spirit actually might have been or might today be right. Shared criteria for adjudication are neither clear nor, it seems, even conceivable. Rival insistences that one really has the spirit only demonstrate the problem. As Erasmus and other early 16th century critics already recognized, 
as English Restoration opponents of religious enthusiasm would reiterate, and as anti-religious propagandists, such as Richard Dawkins, continue to point out today. During the Leipzig Disputation in 1519, Luther said that scripture was the sole authority for Christians unless new and approved revelation is added. Of course, Luther himself did not offer any additions to scripture, although canonicity is related to the same issue with respect to alleged past revelation. Others, however, not only disagreed, but in effect implied that new revelation from God was the means to overcome the impasses. Such claims might be understood as extending convictions about illumination by the Holy Spirit, representing a further point along the same spectrum. Indeed, if the living God was real and could reveal himself to human beings, it would have been absurd to insist that he could not do so in 16th century Europe, just as he had in ancient Israel. Given the conflicting claims by merely human biblical interpreters, what could be more authoritative than direct declarations by God himself about what Christians were to believe and do? From the very beginning of the Reformation era, starting with Thomas Munzer and the Zwickau prophets in 1521, direct revelation from God was regarded by various Christians not merely as supplementary to the Bible, but as the necessary key to its meaning and in some cases as superseding scripture altogether. Claims of robust direct revelation from God were common among alleged prophets throughout the Reformation era. From the Strasbourg prophets of the late 1520s, Lienert and Ursula Joost and Barbara Rebstock, through the early Stuart radical Protestant John Trask, and numerous figures who flourished briefly during the English Revolution. I will spare you a lengthy list for that. You can read my book. More significant for this lecture is that this phenomenon was not restricted to the Reformation era. The best known and most successful modern example is probably the American polygamist Joseph Smith, the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in early 19th century upstate New York. We can extend it up to the present to include figures such as Jim Jones and his People's Temple, which came to its highly publicized end in Guyana in 1978, as well as David Koresh and his Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas, who perished in a conflagration during a showdown with federal officials in 1993. Again, notwithstanding their many differences, all these individuals and groups shared the claim that extra-biblical revelation provides an answer to and transcends the Protestant pluralism produced by Sola Scriptura, a proliferation that is especially apparent in the modern absence of control of religious claims by political authorities. But like less expansive appeals to illumination by the Holy Spirit, claims of decisive extra-biblical revelation did not during the Reformation era and do not today resolve the pluralism that they are intended to overcome. Rather, they simply expanded it even more, just as they do today. Even cursory familiarity with the early modern assertions of people such as Munzer, Melchior Hoffman, Jan van Leiden, Hendrik McClace, George Fox, and others shows that they claimed wildly disparate and contradictory things as divinely revealed by God. From proactive apocalyptic violence to pacifist withdrawal from politics and society. From the necessity of new rituals and liturgies to the unimportance of all externals in religious worship how to evaluate the rival truth claims, whether among early modern Europeans or now, remains even more obscure than how to adjudicate rival claims based on sola scriptura, or scripture supplemented by the Holy Spirit, where at least there are common texts to refer to. Competing assertions of direct revelation from God only exacerbate the condition that they are intended to resolve. Ever since Joseph Smith first began making his claims in the 1820s, for example, the overwhelming majority of Christians have seen them not as a clarifying fulfillment of traditional Christian truth claims, but as bizarre, deeply objectionable departures from them. So Mormonism has become just another component within the contemporary religionscape. In Jan Ships' analysis, a religious tradition as different from historical Christianity as ancient Christianity proved to be different from Judaism. An analysis of conflicting truth claims about matters of human purpose, meaning, and morality over the long term is necessary, but far from sufficient for understanding the postmodern condition within the kingdom of whatever. 
So before concluding my talk with a brief consideration of how modern philosophy has contributed, I will move away from ideas and religious truth claims and talk briefly about institutions. Because rival Reformation-era Christians, protag Christian protagonists, thought that the issues involved bore on the possibility of eternal salvation, they showed themselves willing to kill and die for them. This occurred within individual polities, in the judicial executions of unrepentant heretics or religious traitors, which, from the side of the authorities, sought to eliminate the danger to souls posed by heretics' deadly errors. From the side of executed co-religionists, in stark contrast, such executions created heroic martyrs, whose imitation of Christ extended even through his passion and death. Besides judicial executions, several major civil and international wars of the Reformation era, from the German Peasants' War of the mid-1520s, to the Schmalkaldic War, the French Wars of Religion, the Dutch Revolt against Spain, the Thirty Years' War, and the English Revolution, while not motivated exclusively by or concerned solely with religion, cannot be understood apart from their respective protagonist doctrinal commitments. The religio-political violence of the Reformation era is lucidly intelligible on the terms of its respective protagonists. It also proved unsustainably destructive to the societies torn apart by it. Different solutions were attempted, conceding to territorial rulers in the empire their choice of either Lutheranism or Catholicism after 1555, creating a tenuous place for religious minorities, whether English Catholics beginning in Elizabeth's reign or French Protestants after the Edict of Nantes in 1598 and before its revocation in 1685, or dividing previously united territories, as essentially had occurred in the Low Countries by 1585. Cutting the Gordian knot, though, required the legitimation of Leviathan. As certain pragmatic advocates of compromise began to suggest during the French, war French Wars of Religion, and as Thomas Hobbes argued in 1651, amid the tumult of the English Revolution. Confessional conflicts prompted a new rationale for the state. By saving warring Christians from themselves, it would secure for its citizens an apparently otherwise elusive stability. Beginning in certain respects with the Golden Age Dutch Republic and gaining institutional sanction in the new United States of America in the late 18th century, the eventual outcome would be the state's protection of freedom of religious belief and practice as a solution to the problems posed by antagonistic religious pluralism. We are all familiar with the basic arrangement. In exchange for political obedience, each individual is permitted to believe or not to believe whatever she wishes to practice or not practice whatever religion she prefers, and to express herself with respect to religion in whatever way she would like. In what Mark Lilla has recently called the Great Separation, religion is privatized and religious freedom is made an individual right, with the state alone determining public morality and controlling the public expression of religious practice. The solution to the problem of religious disagreement, intolerance, violence and coercion, as Western writers and journalists repeatedly invoke today with reference to Islam and Sharia, is religious toleration and freedom of religion under the secular state and its laws. Freedom of religion is a means of managing the disruptions that can, and in the Reformation era did, stem from unresolved religious disagreements. Of course, in no respect does it answer questions concerning which, if any, of the rival views might be true. And so it is not a solution to this problem from the Reformation era, which has never gone away. The entire point of politically protected religious freedom is to bracket the question of truth claims by permitting individuals to believe whatever they wish. The state provides the institutional framework for the proliferation of any and every religious truth claim, no matter how ludicrous. If someone were to establish tomorrow a church of Christian geocentrism, declaring all post-Copernican astronomy to be erroneous, such beliefs would receive the same protection as any other claim. In the realm of fact rather than fantasy, we live with tens of millions of fellow citizens who believe that the Earth is 6,000 or so years old, despite the massively corroborated findings of astronomy, geology, evolutionary biology, and genetics. 
all of which strongly imply that our planet is about 4.45 billion years old. In modern democratic states, then, with their politically protected guarantees of freedom of religion, we have the institutional incubator of the postmodern condition. By the open-ended religious pluralism that it permits, it indirectly fosters the impression of relativism, the view that all religion can only be a matter of individual, subjective, and irrational personal preference, even as nearly all of the state citizens regard their respective beliefs as true. Within legal limits, quite literally anything goes as far as truth claims and religious practices are concerned. An extension and a latter-day manifestation of the full range of views produced by the Reformation unfettered. In the public sphere are protected not only all Protestant views derived from the principle of sola scriptura and its adjuncts, but any and all religions, religious claims, and post-religious claims that fill a similar niche. Put bluntly, the historically consequential trajectory runs from Luther's here I stand to the present day slacker mantra, whatever dude. We might think, thank goodness for the advent of modern reason in the Enlightenment, which along with modern science gives us a sensible secular alternative to religious wrangling and efforts to impose sectarian views on society. Before considering whether we are so fortunate, it's important to recognize that reason was variously employed in the Reformation era as yet another means, besides appeals to illumination by the Holy Spirit and claims of new divine revelation, to try to resolve the unintended problems created by Sola Scriptura. Already early in the Reformation, notwithstanding the emphasis on salvation by faith alone among reformers who followed Luther's lead, reason played a crucial role in articulating and defending Protestant claims about what the Bible said and what Christianity was. The subsidiary questions were exactly in what manner and with what scope reason was to be applied. Luther used it in many ways, including in his reading of conciliar decrees as a basis for criticizing Catholic practices with which he disagreed. Zwingli used reason to argue against the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Their contemporary, the Spaniard, Michael Servetus, used reason to reject as unbiblical and incomprehensible the traditional doctrine of the Trinity part of a stream of anti-Trinitarian Christianity that would comprise the historical predecessors of modern Unitarianism. In the 1650s, the Quaker exegete Samuel Fisher, defending the necessity of the inner light, used reason in a scholarly assault on the reliability of Scripture, an effort that influenced a better-known 17th-century biblical critic, namely Spinoza, as well as the Dutch collegians with whom he was friends. Even these few examples show that appeals to reason as a means of resolving the impasses created by Sola Scriptura yielded the same result as appeals to the Holy Spirit or claims of new revelation. Because protagonists differed over how reason was to be applied to disputed truth claims, it became yet another means by which Protestant pluralism was increased rather than overcome. Luther accused Zwingli of denying God's omnipotence. The anti-Trinitarian position was rejected as a blasphemous effort to force God's transcendence within the confines of human comprehensibility, and so on. The same pattern obtained in the 17th century. Weary of doctrinal controversy and its concomitant social disruptiveness, political unrest, and military destruction, Hugo Grotius during the Thirty Years' War and latitudinarian Anglican theologians downplayed the importance of the doctrines that divided Christians. Instead, they championed reason and natural law as the foundations for genuine Christianity appeals which in turn fostered their own disputes. Failing to carry the day then or since, contested competing claims about the application of reason in Christianity have persisted to the present, not only among liberal Protestants, but among evangelicals, Pentecostals, and others. They have further augmented the expansive pluralism of Protestantism, most visibly and influentially in the United States. Contradictory claims based on sola scriptura created an unintended problem. The attempted answers considered thus far have been adjuncts to the Reformation itself. That is, they have presupposed Christian claims about divine revelation in significant continuity with the claims of ancient and medieval Christianity. But such answers are not yet modern, because modernity is secular and rejects all this. <laughs> 
or so the dominant narratives of modernization and secularization tell us. The real way out of the intellectual conundrums, social unrest, political conflict, and religious wars of the early modern period, it is claimed, was not a band-aid, but an amputation. An application of reason alone by modern philosophy and science, whose advocates by the late 18th century were building on 17th century predecessors such as Hobbes and Spinoza. They asserted with increasing frequency that not only Christianity, but all revealed religion was irrational superstition, a view that would be strongly reinforced by others in combination with 19th century historicism and Darwinism. The root problem, it was claimed, was the assumption shared by Protestants and Catholics alike, namely that questions about truth, morality, purpose, and meaning were to be answered in ways that depended on claims of supernatural revelation by a transcendent God who had become incarnate for the salvation of fallen humanity. Did any of this make any sense? Could it endure the scrutiny of critical rationality, whether in ancient forms revivified by late Renaissance thinkers or as developed in new early modern philosophies? The credo of modern philosophy, the Enlightenment and 19th century notions of progress would be that sola ratio, reason alone, could achieve what sola scriptura obviously could not. A clean break with the past was necessary, rejecting Christianity's doctrinal controversies and destructive religio-political wars. Among the ancient philosophies revived in the Renaissance was Peronian skepticism. After the publication of Sextus Empiricus in 1562, skeptical ideas spread especially through Montaigne's enormously popular essays, which treated cultural relativism, skepticism about knowledge of the natural world, and the problem of adjudication among rival religious claims. As Richard Popkin first showed 50 years ago, modern philosophy's foundationalist aspirations, beginning with Descartes, emerged in an intellectual milieu pervaded by skepticism. In an epistemological context, the objective was to transcend skeptical doubt about the possibility of knowledge of moral principles, metaphysics, including God, human nature, and the natural world. In the context of competing views about Christian truth, the objective was to secure a rational foundation for the domains of human life informed by Christianity, and so to provide a means of transcending destructive conflicts. We shouldn't forget that Descartes served as a soldier early in the Thirty Years' War, and Hobbes lived in exile in Paris during the unrest of the English Revolution. By so many problematic truth claims, reason would have to supplant scripture as the foundation for truth. The philosopher would have to reject all inherited traditions and defer to no alleged authorities in order to transcend them all and to exercise the demon of skepticism. After Descartes, quote, first realized how numerous were the false opinions that he had previously taken to be true, and so how dubious was everything he had inferred on their basis, he realized he had to start over. I had to raise everything to the ground and begin again from the original foundations if I wanted to establish anything firm and lasting in the sciences. Hobbes, no less enamored than Descartes with geometry as a model of certainty for philosophy, also insisted on the necessity of finding truth apart from received opinions, texts, and authorities. Those men that take their instruction from the authority of books and not from their own meditation, he wrote in Leviathan, are as much below the condition of ignorant men as men endued with true science are above it. In 1739, David Hume noted the ignorance which still prevailed in the most important questions that can come before the tribunal of human reason in no small part due to the principles taken upon trust, consequences lamely deduced from them, want of coherence in the parts, and of evidence in the whole. Buffeted by the divergent claims of different philosophers, Rousseau emphasized the importance of independent thought. Their philosophy is meant for others. I need one for myself. Let me seek it with all my might while there is still time so that I may have an assured rule of conduct for the rest of my days. For Kant, independence from received authorities plus the exercise of reason was the very essence of Aufklärung and autonomy. Enlightenment is man's release from his self-incurred tutelage. Tutelage is man's inability to make use of his reason without direction from another. Stopere aude, have courage to use your own reason, 
That is the motto of enlightenment. In my book, I develop these and other modern philosophical examples, and I take the endeavor into the 20th century. But you get the idea. The independent exercise of reason by the individual, liberated from the constraints of tradition and deference to authority, is the means by which to discern the truth about morality, metaphysics, meaning, and the material world. There was, and remains, just one problem. Philosophers since the early 17th century have never remotely agreed about what reason dictates, discloses, or prescribes, whether in terms of metaphysics or morality, nor, in contrast with the natural sciences, are there criteria for determining whether their efforts are converging more nearly toward truth. Empirically and historically speaking, parallel to the case with Protestantism, precisely the opposite is the case. Modern philosophy sought to provide what Protestantism certainly did not and apparently could not, via reason rather than scripture. Not only has it failed thus far, but judging from the last four centuries, as well as from contemporary philosophy, there seems no reason to think that it might ever succeed. I wouldn't hold my breath waiting for Jean-Luc Marion, Jürgen Habermas, Julia Kristeva, Hilary Putnam, Peter Singer, Daniel Dennett, and Alvin Plantinga to reach a consensus about the truths of morality and metaphysics on the basis of reason. In their respective ways, the full range of analytical and continental philosophers today simply contributes to the hyperpluralism that characterizes the postmodern condition in the academy. As such, they are the contemporary heirs to 17th century rationalists, empiricists, and neo-Stoics, or 19th century neo-Kantians, Hegelian idealists, and positivists. As Alistair McIntyre has observed, the same critique leveled by late 19th century philosophers against theologians in seeking to discredit theology as a rational discourse with a rightful place in the modern university has long applied also to philosophers. There is no consensus at all among them about the most important questions in their discipline, what methods are best for trying to answer them, or how disagreements about such issues could conceivably be resolved. The first heavy blows against the ambitions of modern philosophy were delivered by Nietzsche in the 1870s and 80s. Despite fancying himself as the first thinker beyond post-Socratic philosophy, Nietzsche just added more competing truth claims to already existing philosophical options. One who took up the Nietzschean option was Michel Foucault, for whom it prompted his shift in emphasis from archaeology to genealogy beginning in 1971. It is no accident that following the collapse of the New Left in the 1970s and 80s, Foucault's neo-Nietzschean thought has become so popular among er American academics in multiple disciplines. It permits the continuation of the liberationist narrative of modernity in a post-Marxist, post-modern idiom, mediating the migration of a secular sense of purpose via scholarship. But if we are consistent, Foucault's philosophy, like that of any other position in modern or postmodern thought considered broadly, is just as constructed as any other. However much it helps to illuminate the particularly self-serving expressions of post-enlightenment rationality deployed in modern Western colonialism or in the modern state's domination of human life. Foucault's thought is not a foundationalist philosophical answer, succeeding where thinkers from Descartes through Husserl failed. It is a constructed product born of late 20th century hyperpluralism combined with disgust at the self-justificatory exercise of power by and for the powerful. This brings us full circle by way of conclusion to a feature of the postmodern condition that I mentioned early in my talk, namely that there are no impregnable intellectual positions or self-evident starting points. There is, however, an enormously powerful state whose limits have in turn acutely been exposed in the recent and continuing global financial crisis. Contemporary Western states permit individuals to believe whatever they wish and to buy whatever they please within the limits of their laws and a pervasive symbiosis of capitalism and consumerism, the societal outcome of avarice renamed in the 18th century as virtuous self-interest, as Albert Hirschman showed over 30 years ago. For whatever we may diversely believe today about what is true and right and good, we are supposed to want ever more and better stuff 
in an economic system organized to deliver an endless proliferation of individual experiences and consumer goods, whether at the income level of Walmart or Bloomingdale's. In the absence of shared views about truth, meaning, values, or purpose amid our hyperpluralism in the kingdom of whatever, this appears to be the cementing ethos and the related practices that hold contemporary Western societies together. It accommodates all politically quiescent truth claims based on religious revelation, no less than those based on anti-religious reason. Thank you. Thing and I've, I've 
started to become aware of it more in the, in the course of not only doing this project, but giving talks and then the kinds of reactions, which almost everybody asks that question, where do we go from here? You know, if you're right, boy, that's really awful. But some people seem to think that because you came up with this analysis right, we don't like that path so much. Just make us another one, right? Because everything has to be getting better. That's the law of history, right? That's what Americans think, especially Americans think that. The 19th century Europeans thought that too. That died in the Great War, between 1914 and 1918, and whatever was left of it was shattered in the Second World War for most Europeans. Americans still think, many Americans, things are getting better and better. Look at the cooler little iPods we have, right? Wow, look at how big and clear my big screen, flat screen TV is. I don't think the acquisition of more impressive technological applications of consumer goods is an index of making a better world. But, you know, that's just me. Yeah? Um, what if you turn the telescope the other direction? Mm -hmm. How postmodern is late antiquity? It's a great question, and I think there are many parallels. Because late antiquity, in many respects, exhibits a kind of heterogeneity that in certain respects is characteristic of what we're talking about now. It's so interesting that you mentioned it. About a month ago, I was having a, a discussion with a colleague at Notre Dame. We were talking about some of these kinds of things. And he offered the suggestion of, as far as he could tell, he thinks we are actually headed toward and, and in a situation that's much more actually like late antiquity than it's been like anything, say, between um, certainly than the 11th century in the present, and arguably even since, uh, say, the 5th century in the present. So I, I, I like that analogy very much. In that respect, it's, it's medieval Europe that's bizarre. That's right. That would be, a, and it's, it's the creation of this, this combination of, to be sure, a great deal of variety and heterogeneity and so forth in, in medieval and, and medieval Europe, but combined with, you know, an extraordinary degree of you know, institutional kind of coherence in a way that is that is extremely unusual. The um, yeah. Anyway, I, I like I like the analogy a lot. I think there's a lot to be to be, to be said for that. Yes. Uh, if I may follow up, and then I have a question of my own. Aren't you um, uh, exaggerating this uh, unifying force in the latest system? You mean the schism between East and West in, in 1054? Indeed. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, I am dealing, this is, a, this is a story about the Western world, about Latin Christianity, and um, not about the Greek East and the Orthodox tradition. Now, one could also tell a story about that, and to do it more comprehensively, we, we, would, have to, we would have to work that in as well. Of course, there are, in doctrinal terms, <laughs> deep, continuing, abiding similarities and, and shared coherences between you know, the Greek East and the Latin West, even after the 11th century, and, and indeed, in many respects, all the way down to the present. Many more so than there are, for example, between the, the Roman Catholic Church and varieties of Protestantism. Um, I'm, I was asked, I've been asked more than once, but I've, I've given this talk or one related to the book, and someone will ask, well, you're talking about the Latin West over 500 years. What about the rest of the world? Sorry, only 500 years, and um, you know the the, the North Atlantic, uh, you know, connection because there's, there's some about Latin America and South America, but not a lot either there. So um, it's not a book about the relationship between because that dynamic is a different dynamic than what created the contemporary Western world, and that's my point of departure. It is looking at North America and Western Europe today. How did they come to be as they are? And 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 the the, the schism of 1054 is not. A significant substantive part of that story, at least I don't think it is. Precisely uh, about that, um, the, the reasons for, <coughs> for, this, uh, for, the, for the current state of affairs, what, how would you describe, or how would you identify uh, the primary cause for the change um, that you are uh, describing from um, the Catholic um, tradition that embraces? the book, the church, and the traditional interpretation, many, many other things. And then, that what you refer to as source of the book. Why does, all of a sudden, um, uh, the, the 
um, uh, the, the, the Christian Maliba um, pen his hopes uh, on the book rather than um, that the, the long-standing institution. It's a good, I mean, well, the Christian believer, I mean, some Christian believers do, right? Some, some of course, reject that, that principle from the outset and subsequently. Um, I mean, that, it, it seems to me that that is a, that's a particular question about the relationship between Scripture and the way in which it historically had been understood as part of, interwoven with the tradition, the liturgy, religious practices, and so forth throughout the Middle Ages. It's a complete myth to think that the Bible wasn't important in medieval Christianity. It's absolutely central. What's, what's distinctive, and, and many would say what was, what was Luther's genius, was seeing the potential that it had to be taken as a principle of critique of the tradition that had fostered, nourished it, passed it down, and indeed interpreted it in a certain way. Of that, that's one element. But what one has to do in order to understand what happens subsequently, and that helps us explain the situation we're in today, is to look at what happens to that principle really right from the very beginning. And so, um, the, I mean, if I follow you right, the, the specific I mean, explanation of why this principle at that time, I mean, you know, many interpreters would, would answer that in, a, in the narrowest sense with a certain kind of biographical analysis of Luther's own trajectory himself. I mean, he, well, I don't think so either, but that, that's um, you know, what, what some people do. Of course, the idea that it's somehow printing itself is, you know, that doesn't work either. Printing's been around for 70 years by the time of the Reformation. It's being used for the extraordinary proliferation of Catholic devotional writings and so forth. I mean, books of hours are by far the most common uh, genre of any printed book in the 50 years prior to the Reformation. So there's nothing about print per se that causes that. Um, it's a complex, it's a complex thing. It's actually, it's a good question, and it's actually not a question that I'm trying to answer in this in this study, but it's a very good one. Oh, yes. To bring the kind of sunny optimism to this, please do. The East European historians are famous for. <laughs> I'm wondering how Habermas's efforts to talk to, to sort of to, to raise the question of we're in a post secular age yep. and if there's a need for some kind of re knitting yep. of various rationalist enterprises with religious impulses. It seems like, yeah, of course, you, you seem to establish a narrative where this is just going to add another layer onto the chaos. What are some possible, presuming that, that we're not living in a Calvinist universe, we <coughs> should be destined to that kind of tradition, um, what are some directions this effort of kind of remitting of secularism yep. take the discourse of the I mean, again, in a certain way, I think this is a kind of, it's a subsidiary of the question earlier about, you know, where do we go from here kind of thing. I mean, I will, well, A, I don't know. It's not a dodge. I really don't. Um, but I would, I would say that I, I do regard it, as far as it goes, as tremendously encouraging that you know, arguably continental Europe's most famous non-believing secular philosopher sat down and went, you know, head to head in a very amicable, civil way with then Joseph Ratzinger, now Pope Benedict XVI, in Munich in January of 2004. And of course, a lot of, um, a lot of let's say, um, Habermasian fans um, were stunned, shocked, asking, you, what the hell are you doing? You know, this is not a good idea, and why are you giving, you know, this the time of day? But Habermas sees, I think, he recognizes in certain respects um, that, that you can't simply just continue to try to pretend that reason alone and, and rationality per se is going to be able to do what it's been trying to do for centuries and it hasn't been able to accomplish. Um, the, uh, the Italian politician and thinker, Marcello Perra, is another one who has acknowledged the same kind of, of uh, uh, necessity as a kind of non-believing Italian, but who says absolutely that these values, these commitments, that, that they need to be preserved and they need to be fostered. Because the there, there have been no right, sustainable viable alternatives. 
So I, I, simp I simply would say that I think it's a good thing. That's certainly better than a kind of, um, you know, the sort of um, uh, pseudo, you know, intellectual ranting that you get from uh, people like, Rich, you know, Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett and these guys. I mean, it, really, that is not only, I think, is it, is it really kind of almost willfully blind in terms of a self-awareness about uh, a serious understanding of history of the situation which we face, but, but it, it, it refuses to acknowledge the, the gravity of the problem, I think. So, I mean, that's, I don't know where we're headed. Yeah, in the middle. Um, it seems to me, like, when I talk to people today, that, like, the church itself is just completely lost, like, lost its luster to people. I mean, like, not for all people, of course, but it just seems like more. Do you think that's just a seed planted from that point, like, in the Reformation, do you think more just how people are today? I think it has a lot to do in the immediate context with uh, the clerical abuse scandals in the United States. I mean, for example, um, you know, it doesn't help when those awful things are done, and it really doesn't help then when you know bishops decided that the thing to do was try to, to make sure nobody finds out about this. That tends to make you know even well-meaning Catholics really upset and you know wondering whether they can trust the institution which they place in the children. That's one very immediate, and it's not just the United States, it's Ireland, it's Belgium, it's other countries too. I certainly don't think it's, um, it's definitely not a kind of long-term, you know, gradual thing from the time of the Reformation. I mean, early modern Catholicism, you know, 17th, 18th century Catholicism in southern Germany, in France, in Italy, in Spain, across you know, the Spanish colony and so forth, actually thriving, actually producing extraordinary works of art, ringing with all kinds of popular devotion, extraordinary theological discourses, and so forth and so on. So it's definitely not that. I will say that I think, and this, this applies not only to, to Catholicism, but I think to uh, religious people of all stripes, that um, Beginning especially in the 17th century, not as a conscious policy, but as a de facto human reality, the increasing growth of um, the production of material goods, commerce, and what in the Industrial Revolution then is going to be right so much more important. I think it's starting in the 17th century, more and more Christians in Europe decide to stop fighting about religion and they decide to start going shopping instead. And I think that, writ very large, that's still what's going on. And um, essentially, the history of the United States, I'm about to start teaching a course at Notre Dame next week called Christianity, Commerce, and Consumerism, the last 1,000 years. And when we get to the United States, what I'm basically going to argue in the class is that you know, very famously in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says flat out, you cannot serve both God and Raymond. The history of American people as in such a Christian nation is essentially a long-term attempt to prove that Jesus was wrong about that. Yes, we can. And we're doing it. Right? I'm Christian, and I've got three vacation homes. And there's no contradiction whatsoever between them. But what people don't like to think about, and this partly is related to the way in which in the modern university, we divide up the, the, the pursuit of knowledge. I'd like to get the environmental scientists together, right, with the economists and the theologians. Because then we might start to see the extent to which an absolutely untrammeled consumerism, which is protected by modern rural states, right, you can buy as much as you want, whatever you want, up to your credit limit. The industrial processes that produce all the stuff, not nearly in the United States anymore, right? We outsource all that being done in China, Indonesia, Mexico, and so forth. It looks very much like it's collectively contributing to um, a problem with climate change. Because it's industrial processes and a China and an India that want to consume just like the United States and Europe that's you know causing the problem. And um, it may very well be that the decision to going to go shopping instead of um, being preoccupied with these other things is collectively making the planet gradually um, <coughs> uninhabitable for everyone. So um, it might not be that you know the better flat screen TVs and the cooler iPods and look at my my new phone and whatnot um, are really leading in a very good direction. So I think that that partly is a response to the religious unrest and the, and the problems of the Reformation era, 
the self-colonization of Christians across denominational divides by capitalism and consumerism is um, something that actually erodes religion over the very long term. Because in fact, you know, where your heart is, where your, where your treasure is, your heart will be. What do people actually do with their lives? How do they actually lead their lives? Right? What are they devoted to? And uh, the whole purpose, it seems to me, of uh, the way in which our political uh, system is organized in relationship to our, our economic realities is to deliver an endless proliferation of stuff to people. And everybody participating in this, right, tends to make them less concerned about all those ideological differences and disagreements. Who cares about your specific views on contentious issue A, B, and C if, you know, you can go to the mall? Or just go online, it's even easier. Sorry, that was kind of homiletic. I didn't know the meaning. <laughs> yes, here. Do you feel that if um, the leaders of the Catholic during the Middle Ages wow. would have have less um, of the, I guess, um, I guess they were practicing more of the priests. Yes. There wasn't as much issue with, you know, the whole Roman Empire having so much control and then, you know, the Jewish people trying to have a or whatever. If that all would have gone down, per se, do you think that that would have directly modified what happened in the Roman This is a great question. It's a very astute question, and um, that all of these kinds of things are they're, they're counterfactuals, right? We imagine a past that if such and such had been the case, what might have transpired? We can never know. We can make intelligent guesses. I think a huge reason for the success of the Reformation in the 16th century is the extent of the problems within Catholicism in the late Middle Ages. It's extremely difficult for me to think that if, you know, um, Popes and bishops hadn't been, as the great economic historian R. H. Tawney said, said um, men who preached a lesson uh, in abstinence and gave in their practices, right, and exercising greed. That um, the emergence of the very thing I was talking about before, right, the early modern takeoff of consumption, that then leads into the industrial revolution. I don't think it would have happened in the same way. So yeah, I mean, you know, people. People will say, oh, you know, Gregory is very critical of Protestantism and modern rationalism. What I'm really critical of also is medieval Christianity. Because ways in which it's exercised. I mean, when I say, I'll tell you, well, here's the conclusion of my book. One sentence, medieval Christendom failed, the Reformation failed, confessional Europe failed, and modernity is failing. How's that for a <laughs> but, but medieval Christendom failed. And it failed precisely because there was such widespread a widespread gap between what the teachings were on the one hand and what Christians did on the other, which is critical. The, the character of the failure of the Reformation is a different kind of failure. It's a failure to be able to agree about what you say the foundation of truth is. The failure of confessional Europe is a different kind of failure again. It's a failure of military and political re leaders to create confessionally homogeneous societies. <laughs> Modernity, right, is an attempt to deal with that problem by saying people can believe what they want to believe. That leads people to exercise their constitutionally protected rights to buy whatever they want, which leads to global warming. So you see, that's how it works. Yeah. Another kind of question. Good. These are great. Well, there you go. <laughs> um, I mean, the other thing that you point out about the uh, labor wages is the extraordinary popular investment yes. in religious devotion. It seems to me that what, what another way to phrase that is an huge margin in the percentage of the population which is being asked to exceed to those truth claims that everyone officially has anyway. Mm -hmm. It seems to me when you ask an enormous number of people to exceed the truth claims, you are radically increasing the chance that some of them won't or will take those in another direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, is, and, and you're asking, is this is this a and factor that plays into the, the had had the bishops may have a problem? Success yeah. of popular devotion. Yeah, well, that's I mean that is that, I think that's a very interesting a very interesting point. The other thing that I would say too about about late medieval um, Christianity and this you know the, 
asking people to accede to the doctrinal claims per se, is that in, in late medieval Christianity in particular, in Catholicism in, in general, although this is much less so in the contemporary world for, for reasons that are actually the result of what I'm analyzing, doctrines are not separate from practices. I mean, medieval Christianity is first and foremost, it's, it's a lived way of life. The doctrines are only there, as it were, in, in the background. When, when, when Augustine, right, so even Augustine already in the early 5th, 5th century, the very end of the 4th, in an incredible statement, I mean, when you think about the dust, absolutely steep in the Bible, knows it backward and forward, right? He is steep in Scripture. Augustine says in De Doctrina Christian, uh, uh, Christian, that a Christian formed in faith, hope, and love has no need of the Scriptures except to instruct others. In other words, it's about these virtues lived in community with other people. If you're doing that, there's not really, it seems to me, this may be a bit idealistic, but I think, um, I mean, I, I, you can show, show examples of it more or less in different ways. If people are living a shared life like that, doctrinal critiques really don't arise. I mean, it is a shared life that is satisfying, that is fulfilling, that is in which people are actually genuinely helping one another and so forth and so on. And the ways in which medieval Christianity tries to um, resolve those sorts of issues by basically religious orders and vow religious are the ones who try to do that right in their little micro communities. The wider society, eh, trickier, right? Dicier, much more heterogeneous and much more problematic. So I think I think there's much there's much to what you suggest. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Let me try with more. This is a lot being half empty instead of half full. Go ahead. Um, Charles Taylor is trying to argue that with the sort of the development of various, the sort of multifaceted secularism and unbelief in modernity, that the dialectical relationship with faith is precise. Believers have become ever more conscious and ever more aware of their choice to believe. It's less yeah. a sort of default mode. Yeah. That in a sense, he's arguing that there's been qualitative, and, and as I read it, an improved way of believing for the modern believer precisely because we can think our lives and make sense of our lives in totally secular terms. I can give myself over to consumerism, to the world, to the modern nation state, and it's all good. But I don't have to do that. I can make that additional leap to belief that really is personal, is a choice, and therefore has a quality about it that at least Taylor argues, and I think there's something to it, is superior to simply being in a community where, you're just, where those are just unthoughts. You're just not allowed to think your life outside of categories that are enforced, delivered, and where, as you put it, that basically the play, the, the sort of the playground the, is, is guarded, and you're just not allowed to go outside. And, and so in that sense, one of the real gifts of modernity is that, in a sense, we're experiencing a kind of faith that has more in common um, with early Christianity. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's an interesting point, parallel again to late antiquity in certain respects, at least prior to Constantine and prior to Theodosius. Um, yeah, I mean, I, what can I say? I mean, I think I see what he's saying. I mean, I know what he, what he has, or something to it. I mean. It, but it does, that strikes me as itself a particularly modern way of thinking about you know, what religion is. It strikes me as a particularly kind of Protestantized understanding, right? The individual can make a choice about what he or she, right? Um, and I think that, oh, one can, yeah, I, I see what, he, what, he, what he's getting at. There is a kind of ownership to it, right? There's a kind of self-consciousness, a self-awareness of it that isn't necessarily there in, in other kinds of settings. And I also think that there, there's much to be said about the, um, the kinds, there, there are many legitimate criticisms to be made about the way in which, um, you know, tightly knit traditional uh, religious communities you know, function and so forth. And I think very often, I mean, much more often than, than not, fell far short of, you know, ideally what they were supposed to produce and so forth and so on. Nevertheless, um, yeah, I think, <coughs> the other thing I think about, the real problem with Taylor's book, in my, in my view, is, he, he's, he thinks, still largely speaking, in kind of pockle 
terms. That is, we are like this, right? They were like that, and we are like this, right? The porous self, right? The buffered self, and then you know, right? The, 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 the open world, right? And the imminent frame. We, but that doesn't do justice to the, the, the pluralism, in fact, of, of the kinds of religious believers that are around us. Taylor seems sometimes to think that you know we all shuttle back and forth between two stances. No, we don't. Some people do. Not everybody does. I mean, I know lots of religious believers who, as far as I can tell, don't. They don't doubt at all about what it is that they're, or at least there's no sign that they do. Um, I just think there's a lot more heterogeneity. That's why, I mean, again, you know, it's the two you know, great Catholic philosophers, Taylor and McIntyre. I think McIntyre is closer to, to the mark about his, his diagnosis and his analysis of the situation that we're in, which is you no know, coincidence. That's why my analysis is more like not like Alison McIntyre's that are just like Charles Taylor's. But anyway. Great question, because it's so much fun. Look at how many people stayed. It's annoying. Don't you have anything better to do? <laughs> anyway, let me go. Let's thank God. Thanks a lot. Major funding for the George Washington Forum is provided by the Charles G. Koch Charitable Foundation, the APGAR Foundation, the Veritas Fund for Higher Education Reform, and the Thomas W. Smith Foundation. For more information, please visit us on the web at www.ohio.edu slash Washington Forum. Thank you.